For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Did you know that Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman is the first woman finance minister to serve out a full tenure in North Block? Did you know this is the last full-fledged budget before general election next year? So what will it be on 1st February? Will this government succumb to populism and serve an electoral-friendly budget? Or will it instead invest in a 25-year plan that will transform India to a middle-income economy in 2047? Welcome to another edition of Capital Calculus. I am your host, Anil Padmanabhan. Last year, the government of India budgeted an expenditure which was almost a sixth of India's GDP. That is a staggering number. But India is not unique. Post-COVID world, governments world over are spending to pick up the pieces of their shattered economies. So what will it be on 1st February? To get a sense of this and more, we spoke to Hasid Drabu. He's the former finance minister of Jammu and Kashmir and an economist. I began by flagging the inclement economic conditions facing the world. Never before have four back-to-back -back crises hit the world of, with this magnitude and this frequency. So I asked Hasid, how will it influence finance minister Nirmala Sitaraman's thinking ahead of the budget? As you said, this is an exceptionally difficult situation, not just economics, but even in politically and socially is a difficult situation. From that perspective, I think the finance minister would perhaps look at a bi-pronged uh, strategy. Uh, the first one being to insulate the Indian economy from the impending global recession that we are now pretty sure is going to get difficult, uh, severe with every uh, month uh, as we go along. Uh, that is easier uh, said and done because Indian economy historically hasn't um, hasn't um, been driven by exports. Uh, we account for only two percent of the international trade. So insulating the economy would be one one measure that uh, she could uh, look at, and that comes through in policy terms in terms of uh, the home market constraint. That there is no home market constraint, and you rely on the home market for economic growth, which is getting reflected in the GDP growth of the past year or so, which is still the fastest, India is still the fastest growing economy and based on, on the home market. So, and the home market is quite buoyant. So that would reflect, and as we go, we can discuss this further, that that will, uh, you know, have an impact on the expenditure, public expenditure policy as well as the public investment policy. The second part, which I think is very critical, uh, is that this uh, inclement uh, global situation, as you put it, also has an opportunity, largely because of China. So what you could do is ready the scaffolding, as it were, for a China plus one strategy for India. That's where the opportunity will arise. The only good news about the series of economic setbacks impacting the world is that they are one-off in nature, in the sense their impact will wane over a period of time. We are already seeing that with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. What will this mean for the recovery of the Indian economy? Do you believe that as and when this impact wanes, the recovery in the Indian economy will be even sharper than what most anticipate? We already has been in many ways a, a fairly sharp uh, recovery, largely because of the way the economy has been managed. Where we need to take to the next level is to also look at what are the growth impulses post all that has happened, whether it's COVID or GST, or demonetization. These were shops in the system at that point of time. But as we go along, you find that these were structural changes that were required to be made. Now that we are in the middle of all those and we have kind of benefited from that in terms of growth, we need to reorient our policy, let's say, in terms of startups. Today, that's the name of the game, really, which and you can find how many unicorns India has produced. If you look at it from that perspective, then there has to be a special focus on startups and they start engaging in the space being vacated by, uh, let's say, China or the whole relocation of demand that happens. There has to be something of that kind within a focused area of 
the institutions that are growing, one need not rely on the generic corporate sector as a whole, but focus on uh, on startups, which would also provide a whole lot of other macroeconomic things that today we are struggling with, whether it is in terms of unemployment or in terms of valuation and stuff. So I think that's where the focus would lie. And the mantra would be, let's cater to the replacement demand through newer bodies, which are fleet-footed, which don't have the organizational legacies of the past for a, for a large enterprise to create a different market, goes through a whole range of activities where a startup is quick without being legacies can capture, capture that market without overhead costs and all that, making it very competitive. So I think we also need to reorient some of the stuff that we've been doing with a focus on how uh, how things have pan out. But for sure, to answer your question, another way is that uh, these are one-off events, but they have changed the playing field, as it were. And that has given India an opportunity. What Hasib just flagged is significant. If indeed the growth is to come from the new sectors, then... India is all set for a fascinating makeover. Like some of our traditional sectors are subject to global shocks, particularly those linked to energy. But if you go down this path where you're saying on startups, etc., you are going to create a new nervous energy in the system as it were, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, ab that's very critical because, you know, what we have, if you look at the conventional India, hey, it's a commodity corporations. Look at the top five. All of them are commodity corporations. Uh, they are driven by whether it's metals, whether it's you know other commodities. All of them are a quantum commodity, which is why we have been going through a cyclical move. Now, if you were to intervene at that space and build a system which is a asset light, because that's rather an important thing now, where the ownership is very different, plus has the agility to look at the evolving global markets and penetrate those markets. That is where incentivization is required. And that's where the energy will come from. So it's in some ways the new India, which is which grows on the back of new Indians, right? We have had historically the 1950s, uh, you know, what was the Bombay plan, which still continues. Well, we need now a Mumbai plan, so to say, you know, which is new, which has a whole new dynamic to it, which is uh, more about growth and valuations, where monetization of assets happens, where ownership changes, I think you have not seen a single change in ownership in the Indian uh, uh, Indian Inc. in the last 40 years. It's been the same. Funded by banks, owned by promo, which is one model. Now let's look at a newer model for a new age India where it generates not just growth impulses, but also valuations, wealth, monetization, a whole new, new stakeholders are in place. We are today the only country that has the highest number of professional billionaires. So let's ride that wave and go on to a different level uh, rather than trying to reform the mindset of the earlier one. What is being proposed here is a new Indian economy driven by a set of new economic stakeholders. But will the FN prefer to play safe given that the general election is just a year away? Will it go the UPA way who in 2008 announced a massive farm loan waiver? Last full-fledged budget that this government will be presenting. So there were, you know, two options before them. They can go the freebie way and appeal to electoral votes, or they can do what you are suggesting, play a nation-building card, recognize the new challenges, new opportunities, and go down that path. Uh, and, you know, give up like what UPA did in 2008 uh, budget ahead of the 2009 polls, with that huge farm loan waiver. So what do you think will be NDA's choice this this budget? It has to be a bit of both, Anil. I mean, uh, let us face the true compulsions of real compulsions. I have contested elections. I have fought elections. I know what the game is at that level. While these are grand uh, you know, ideas that one would want to propagate, fact is that at the end of the day, people who vote have to have something uh, you know, tangible beneficial for that. To that extent, what, uh, what has happened in the past five years is both an indication as well as a roadmap. Public expenditure policy has moved away from subsidizing generically to being very targeted and addressing some of the basic requirements. In fact, the first few years of this government, uh, public expenditure policy went through a radical transformation where public investment dropped from 27-28% to 12.5%. Uh, 
So the focus was not investment. The focus was public expenditure for a variety of reasons, generating demand and so on and so forth. But uh, there is need now to go back to the CapEx part of it, reorient the public expenditure policy, gear it towards public investment. Because in the last few years, we have noticed for a, for whatever reasons, whether it's the banking sector, the Thaji or whatever, there has not been much of capital formation in the, in the Indian economy. Capacities, new capacity are not been created. Which is why I was also emphasizing the whole point of an asset light model of growth rather than this. Uh, because newer forms will require newer things, even for energy that you were mentioning. With new uh, fossil fuels and all, you know, coming in and you have a new greener fuels coming in, you will need energy distribution networks, which need a lot of capex. And private sector won't do that. So how will green ammonia be distributed? How will hydrogen be distributed? If you want to move away from carbon, then a new infrastructure has to be developed. This is the time for government to intervene. So I think it will be this time around. My sense is that while there will be a lot of talk about uh, public expenditures and giving jobs and stuff like that, the budgetary numbers, if you look at them carefully, would be more towards capital expenditure and you know creating a growth impulse that will happen. On 1st February, FM Sitaraman will present the 10th budget of the NDA. The previous UPA regime too logged this very important milestone. So how does the political economy of budget making of the two regimes stack up? You see, what we have been saying for long is that there is no difference between um, the BJP and let's say the Congress, the uh, NDA and UPA in terms of economic ideology, largely because 1991 was a path-breaking year and the legacy has continued. Now, no matter what reforms you do, it's a part of the 1891 reforms. That's how uh, it has it has panned out. Um, that you would see that uh, reforms, uh, no matter which reform, including something like GST, for instance. But as we go along, you can see there's a nuance different than is emerging. For instance, one of the biggest things that has not been given due recognition is how public expenditure has been democratized uh, in this five years, starting with, or perhaps with Mr. Jekyll started his first budget, which I remember I wrote for Mint at that point, saying that this is India's first federal budget. You've gone beyond the state transfers, which happened with the 14th Commission. You doubled virtually the state transfers, but also the earmark of expenditures to panchayats. One lakh crores was you know, transferred to panchayats. Now, that democratization of public expenditure, which was otherwise done in the corridors of uh, Planning Commission or DTIO, is now decentralized totally. It has a huge impact on the quality of work that is done because the panchayats are responsible for the road that is done next to their houses. Going forward, it is very clear that the states will be a very important element of New India's economic matrix. After all, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. I asked Hasib, as a former finance minister, how he saw this playing out. So how, do, how does India manage this? One, make states part of the growth process. We ensure some kind of equity. You know, uh, what you have done for citizens, you must also do for states. If you have empowered the citizens, you empower the states also. There was an anomaly at one point of time that a citizen could hold foreign exchange and the states could not. Now, that's the level to which it had uh, at some point sunk. We need to look at how does one empower the states going forward. We are no longer into a command-regulated economy. Uh, command driven economy. We are a regulated economy. Not a single state has a single item on its regulatory agenda. Again, more than fiscal policy, monetary policy is very important. What has happened to the five boards of RBI? I don't even know if you ask any of them, when did they last meet? To look at the requirements of those five regions. We have five regional boards of RBI. They must have some input into monetary policy, right? So similarly, when you're looking at regulatory behaviors, it's all centralized today. You need to engage the states into that kind of policy making for them to be willing participants. Um, this government had talked about cooperative federalism, for sure. But there are instances where it has not worked that way. Uh, and uh, we have not had the same kind of participation. In fact, post the Finance Commission, there's a big disjuncture between what the southern states got in terms of population and other criteria. But more on, I mean, more than that, 
it's about how you engage the states because states spend collectively more than the center. States raise more revenues than the center does. So they have, you know, they have a huge influence on on the, on the macroeconomic uh, situation. So we need to see how one can get that part of the states by engaging them in policy making, both at the regulatory level, at the monetary level, and of course at the fiscal level, whereby it's not targeted. Today, if you look at an average state, honestly, having run a state for four or five years, the flexibility of a state is very very limited. It's all tied grants. Tied expenditures, even borrowing that time. According to Hasib, this year's budget will talk politics but do good economics. We'll know for sure only on 1st Feb. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Strat News Global on YouTube. Hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates. And please do share your insights, thoughts, and comments with us. I'm available on Twitter at Capital Calculus. I'll be back next week with another episode. Till then, stay safe.